Hello, my friends. This is Heather. This is the Celebrity Edition of the Back to Me podcast with some amazing humans. This week is Cara Jefferson, and we are talking why eating and having an unhappy belly can actually affect your mood and your skin and kind of everything, which is pretty amazing. I apologize in advance. The audio cuts in and out a little bit, but stick with me because it's a great conversation. Uh, Let me know what you think. Take care, my friends. See you soon. Hi, my friends. Welcome. This is the Back to Me podcast, and this is Heather, and I am super excited that you're here. You are going to hear some tips and some tricks and some ideas to help you live your happiest and healthiest self. I call it Back to Me because when you are taking care of yourself, Back to Me, then you can take better care of others, and we can all make the world a better place. This is Wellness Your Way, and I am super happy that you're here. Hello, my friends. How are you? I hope you're having an outstanding day. This is Heather. This is the Back to Me podcast. This is the super amazing celebrity edition where I talk to some awesome humans about things that I think you will find helpful and interesting. And as always, I always get to learn stuff as well. So back to me. So today's awesome human is Kara, right? Did I say it right? Kara Jefferson. Yes. Yay for me. Yay, you did good. And we're going to talk health, uh, wellness, obviously, but we're going to talk a little bit about gut health and all the things that could affect, I guess. Is that how it's, is that how it goes? Do those pillars affect your health? But before that, wait, before that, we want to know about you. Before I just dive into the hard questions. So about Kara, how... What brought you into this world of guts? <laughs> so I think before I even knew the correlation between the gut and so many of our health problems, I was having my own gut issues and didn't really even know it. Um, when I was younger, we lived overseas in Malaysia for seven years. And I'm mentioning that for a reason. I'll get you know, so fast forward a few years, we moved back to Louisiana. I was in high school. Then I went on to college, biology major, wanted to go to med school. But then I kept getting sick, like for these extended periods of time a year. And finally, after having blood diarrhea for over a month, losing weight, like not wanting to eat because everything hurt my belly. Um, I went and I saw the doctor and they were like, no big deal. You just had a stomach virus. And I was like, there's no way. <laughs> Number one, there's not a stomach virus that lasts for a month or right. close to a month. That's number one. And number two, most stomach viruses don't cause bloody diarrhea. Right. right? So I got mad at that visit and I, you know what? No. There's something wrong, and I found gastroenterologist. I actually called multiple until I could figure out who would see me first. And after I went, he set me up for a colonoscopy like the next, you know, week, right at the beginning. I had a colonoscopy, and he says to my parents that I had one of the worst kinds of Crohn's disease that he's ever seen. What? Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease. It can affect you anywhere on the gastrointestinal tract from your mouth all the way to the anus. But with Crohn's disease, people usually develop these little skip lesions, which means it's not like a continuous piece of your gut. It's like in little patches. They become really inflamed. And so, you know, that's what led me on the on my journey, I eventually years and years later figured out that I also had a parasite, a strongyloide, which could have been potentially, apparently it was very big. It could have been there for years and years, even going back to the time that I lived overseas. Whoa. 
the things we don't know that are going on inside of us. Um, I found out a year after being in Africa, I had schistosomiasis, which is another weird parasite. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and like you never would know because it's not something that you see because it's happening on the inside of you. And not everything is instantaneous, right? We think, oh, I got this worm. Now all of a sudden I'm going to have these symptoms right now. And and That's some, not how it works. And, and I think sometimes like your, your doctor who said you just had a stomach virus, they don't, you, it can hang around and you just think, oh, it's just a normal this. Oh, it's just this. Oh, it's just this. Instead of, oh, there's actually something wrong. Right? Yes. <laughs> so when you found out, then what did you do? Like now you actually have something you can do about it or can you? Well, so, you know, the overwhelming message after I got diagnosed was, number one, it was that thing that I hated. It was the pitiful look that people would give you, like, I'm so sorry to tell you, but you're just going to be on medications for the rest of your life, and nothing is ever going to make it go away, but we put you on the medicines to control your symptoms. Right. That I was told over and over and over. So I did all the things. I took the medicines that they told me to take, bumped up, right? Prednisone to big guns, the biologics and the immunosuppressants, took all of them. And I never got better. I never got better until it had multiple surgeries. So multiple parts of my intestines taken out. And then um, I had two bowel perforations. And even after my bowel perforations, then I started to keep getting small bowel obstructions because nothing was passing through the way that it should. And with every surgery, you form scar tissue. And that scar tissue is called, leads to something called adhesion. So imagine every time you have surgery, you're getting more scar tissue. And that very same scar tissue is what's causing the small bowel obstructions. So this vicious cycle. Right. So I said, nope, I'm not doing another surgery. I found a place in Florida that did some manipulative physical therapy on my abdomen to help break some of that up. And in the conversation, we, she was explaining to me about other health modalities, and that led me to functional medicine. And so do you practice it now, or do you, did you just use it? I'm trying to remember. I was just using it at that time. Right. And how, so I know when we go the direction of finding the ways to let our bodies heal ourselves, because we're so impatient, you know, we always think medicine is faster, but when you started using that functional medicine, did you notice that you just suddenly started to improve or? Yeah, well, I learned a couple of things. I learned first that oh my gosh, diet is huge and the environment that we're in is huge. You know, your genetics have some part in this, but stress is also huge. And the only thing that I was ever told was keep your stress low because that is the thing that's going to actually trigger you. But nobody ever gave me tools to actually do that. Right. Yeah. They don't know how to do it. They just know what you're supposed to do. Right. right. And they, nobody ever told me like, you know, my diet for many, many years consisted of bread, crackers, rice, because those were things that my gut could tolerate. But me not knowing any better, who knew I was actually really sensitive to gluten, you know, oh, no. but I'm consuming all of these things because nobody, that's the way that they were taught. So I don't actually blame any particular doctor. I blame the system as a whole because we're just not being educated properly. And I can also say that as a nurse practitioner, like we don't have nutrition classes right. in our programs. But, but we know that we, I mean, we know instinctively nutrition affects 
our health and affects, um, I mean, and health isn't just, you know, the, the weight epidemic that's going on, but, um, I liked, so I, I was looking at you were, we were commenting on how many things your gut health affects besides your weight, right. And besides mm -hmm. everything. So what did you find in your functional medicine? Like what were some of your big surprises that besides the stress thing, did they teach you how to deal with stress? And were there other things in there that you found were surprising? Yes. Yeah, so the power of the mind is huge, and I learned a lot about that um, in functional medicine, but I also learned how, you know, when I was depressed and at my lowest, when I was going through all this stuff and my was inflamed, I was depressed because mood is related to gut, <laughs> gut health, um, the joint pain related oh. to gut health, the memory problems or the brain fog gut health, skin, gut health, like every single body system almost was related to what was going on inside of your gut. And did you heal it mostly? Yeah. So my Crohn's disease has been in remission for the past three and a half years. Wow. So still celebrating and no I feel fabulous. And did you, so did you find that just uh, fixing diet things helped you and what kinds so uh, sensitive to gluten but do you, is that like the only thing you had to do or is that do you think that most people are sensitive to gluten I mean I, I know there's arguments all most around people, but yeah I think most people are sensitive to gluten um, people don't even know it and so one of the things that I did was the immune protocol diet. what's it what's that again the autoimmune protocol Okay. AIP. Oh, AIP. Um, yeah, because it 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 helps you to eliminate big classes of food, right? You get rid of whole grains, you get rid of nightshades, legumes, and you do it in a systematic fashion, so that once you reintroduce things, you are really well in tune with your body to be able to add things back. So. There are, th there are times now where I can eat something that I think is safe and then all of a sudden I'll have a post-nasal drip and I'm like, something in that did not agree with me, right? So right. I am really in tune with my body. And it took you a while to get there, obviously. I mean, uh, it's a trial and error. And do you find, so the way that we, the world is these days, you know, it's, it's very hard, I think, on a practical level for super busy people to eliminate. Like I can remember when I went off dairy, how hard it was for me to just to go to a restaurant because so much stuff has cheese in it or, you know, extra cheese, or extra this and extra that. And so what did you find that helped you in a kind of a practical way to start like, how long does the AIP take? I know that's multiple questions. So AI, but... <laughs> well, AIP, it takes, I think it's different for everybody because when you start doing food reintroductions, sometimes it goes really smoothly and sometimes it doesn't. So right. it's very individualized. I can't pinpoint, you know, a specified amount of time for anybody else. Uh, but yes, I also, I can't have dairy. So I 1000% relate. And right. so, you know, my family, they joke and they're like, oh, she's gluten free. She's night free. She's dairy free. Oh, she's taste free, which <laughs> right. is not true. <laughs> well, and I find it funny that sometimes, you know, well, meaning people will say, oh, there's just a little bit of cheese on it. So <laughs> So yes. I, I, sometimes I say, well, there's just a little bit of strychnine in your tea. Sorry. Like that's not too bad. Right. <laughs> right. Because it's like, it's just a little bit, it won't hurt you much, but in the grand scheme of things it does. So what kind of, what kind of things did you do to help you kind of navigate through that elimination or was it kind of a normal, was it a norm for you already to be? Yeah it was normal for me. I didn't have any problems. Um, 
I'll tell you, at one point I did this sugar. You'd be surprised how much sugar is in things and how many different names sugar goes by. And so I decided one day to quit sugar cold turkey. And my cousin literally found me on my pantry room floor on day three, bawling my eyes out. <laughs> that was the hardest thing that I have done <laughs> by far. <laughs> Were you crying because you couldn't find any sugar? <laughs> I was crying because I, you know, day one was fine. Day two, I was a little bit irritable, but day three, my body was like having full on meltdown. <laughs> About sugar. Mm -hmm. So, um, and sugar is in things Everything. you don't even know. Salad dressing. like. Everything. It's in everything because they know that it ta makes things taste good, right? And when things taste good, we want more of them. So it's helping all of the food manufacturers sell their products, but it's making us sicker. Right. And I guess, so... I mean, knowing like one of the dangers of sugar is overconsumption, but what else does sugar? Sugar is highly, it's inflammatory. Oh. So think about too, the number of people who have diabetes or pre-diabetes and that number keeps rising and rising and rising um, because you're you're feeding it right and then a lot of women they are like i don't know this is because i see this in practice i don't know why i keep getting these chronic yeast infections because the yeast is feeding on the sugar and so we keep having all of these vicious cycles fed by the sugar mm. and you know it is true like if and Sometimes I say I need a buffer. If I just have something chocolate where I have nothing else in my stomach, I, my head, oh my God. And I think, no, I'm just tired. I'm just going to lie down. But if I was honest with myself, it was the brownie that did it to me because I haven't totally eliminated all the things that I maybe would do me some benefit. And when we were so, and we, were, we alluded to earlier that you had core pillars mm -hmm. of wellness. And tell, tell me about what those are. So, of course, it's diet and, you know, eating hygiene. It's also stress, which we've mentioned. Sleep. I cannot, cannot stress the importance of sleep. But also in toxins, right? So there's environmental toxins. Um, but toxins also ties into toxins in your food, potentially toxic people, toxins overall. So those are like real, the core pillars of what I do. And so you said something interesting. You said eating hygiene. So is that just like being super clean, squeaky clean and not letting even a sprinkle of Parmesan on your plate? <laughs> No. And you know, that's so I'm glad you actually said that because I do want to address it. So even though I need for people to understand my top three strengths are responsibility, discipline, focus. So that's why for me doing an elimination diet and only very rarely cheating is easy. But other people, it's not like that. I don't expect most people to be like me. Um, but when I say eating hygiene, I'm talking about the eating experience because most of us don't think about eating as an experience, right? Most people just think they eat because they have to and not that eating is this sexy topic. But I really try to make eating an experience. And so what, what I mean by that is like when after I get a food, I sit down I want to like sit down and I want to take a couple deep breaths and I want to smell that food because smelling that food starts to get those digestive enzymes going, right? It's getting your body ready. It's like, oh, 
it's almost time to eat. And so that starts activating things early. But it's also making sure that you're not in McDonald's drive through or in Chick-fil-A drive through eating on the run and cramming it all in in five minutes, right? right. It's, a, it's an affair that you really want to take seriously. And let's not even get, in, get into the chewing. <laughs> and chew, so like, get into the chewing. Some people don't chew. And I, yeah, it's, are you supposed to chew 32 times? Is that a real thing? It is a real thing. The average American only chews a bite of food six times before they swallow it. When should we be chewing 20 to 30 times per bite? You actually want food to get almost li completely liquefied before you swallow it. And I've had so many people tell me, like, because I'll say that and then they'll do it. And they're like, but I don't like the way that feels in my mouth. <laughs> the more you do it, the more you get used to it and it just becomes second nature. Well, and I can hear people like people who are super busy because there are people who listen to this podcast who like barely even have time to listen to the podcast. It's like, how am I going to have time to chew my food 20 times and you're telling me to sit and enjoy my dinner? Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? The other thing is liquids, right? Right. When we, when we go to restaurants, what's the first thing they do? They come and they take your drink order and then you're drinking all this stuff and then they keep refilling, right? That is so bad because when drinking long amounts of food with meals, it's diluting those stomach acids. And so then they're not doing what they should be doing. So my rule of thumb is get a smaller cup right. <laughs> just for meal time, and then no more than four ounces. And so some people that's tricky. Right? And so then I'll say, well, what kind of vegetables are you eating? Because if you're eating something like cauliflower or broccoli that's, or zucchini or squash, something with higher water content, use that to your advantage. So if you've just had a piece of meat and now you're like, oh gosh, I need some water or something, instead of grabbing that cup, Put that piece of broccoli or zucchini or something. Take a bite of that, and that generally will help settle things down. Wow. And I, I never <laughs> thought about the. I'm just thinking about the water because I do, I do enjoy a good beverage <laughs> while I'm and, while I'm having yeah. something to eat. Right. Yeah. Most of it should be consumed outside of meal time. So the majority right. of your fluid intake should be outside of meal time. And I like how, and it's, I like how you said, you know, you don't expect people to be <laughs> as disciplined as you. I was like, whew. Although it's funny because as humans, you know, we, we know what's, when we learn, once you learn what will help you be happy and healthy and feel good all the time, the, the, as you say, the discipline to actually follow that is challenging. And I, I'm still working on why that is. I don't know why we're our own worst enemies. Um, that's probably some kind of master's psychology degree person is studying that way. Right. Well, and it, you know, it's okay. I think, I think that's the problem is we set these high, high standards for ourselves. Not that anybody else has them. They're we're telling our own selves a story. And this is like something that I go through with my clients too. Like, what story are you telling yourself? Because is that really true? Or is it that you made up your head? So my like mindset is really pivotal to all of this. And if you have done everything right, and today you are feeling great, and your gut is doing good, and you want to go and have a meal, and you know that that could potentially affect you later, Go ahead. Like, they have rules to be able to correct that and come home and get back on course. So it's about having, you know, knowing what to do if you get off course. If you keep veering off course, a lot of times people need somebody to bring them back. Right. Yeah, this is true. It's always good to have someone. I was on a podcast on Tuesday. I'm like, it's always good to bring a friend. <laughs> someone can yes. help you get back on. And if you've crashed, lift you up and help you out. And the other thing I was thinking about the eating hygiene and the way you eat. 
And these are all tied together. The way you eat, reducing stress and sleeping are all, I even count sleeping as a mindful practice. It's like it is. making sure that, that, so this is a tricky way. If you don't like sitting and meditating, these are tricky ways to, to, to meditate, like have a meal and just have your meal. You know, when you're stressed out, deep breaths into your belly and get enough sleep. It's all ways to help your mind just turn down the volume. Absolutely. And That's shifting from that sympathetic go, go, go state, fight or flight, and that rest, digest, you know. And if you are in that go, go all the time, it's hard to drop into sleep if you only give yourself, you know, I go to bed at this time and I have to get up at this time. You don't even give yourself time to turn down the volume. Nope. And when I was thinking about toxins and sleep, I mean, light is a pollutant for when we're trying to sleep. And I don't know that everybody and people always realize um, how much better you can sleep if it's actually dark and quiet, <laughs> right? Agreed. When it's dark, so I like to, so my, I call it sleep hygiene. And so, you know, everybody needs a sleep routine because if you have a routine, you're more likely to get the rest that you need. Um, but it's setting the stage, just like with eating. You're prepping your body to start shutting down and ready to go to sleep. If you are eating right before you go to sleep, your body is not doing what it needs to do to be able it's to digesting. Wind down. It's digesting, <laughs> not getting ready to sleep. If you're watching the TV and because this happens, this used to happen in my house where the t this TV would be on, radio would be on, and the iPad is on, and the computer is on. Number one, all the blue light is not good for you when you're ready to go to sleep. Like, I have an idea. Why don't we just take TVs out of bedrooms? The people who do that, I, I know people are like, what? actually, there have been studies that show that when people are not watching TV, not on gadgets, all of these things, that they are actually getting better quality of sleep than those people who have a TV on and are hearing that same TV message and the light all night long. I have a, a 10 o'clock rule that, and actually my phone, if I'm on my phone, my phone, the screen goes to black and white at 10 PM. And I go, Oh my God, why am I looking at this thing? Because it's not attractive anymore. It's black and white, but it's also my 10 PM Heather. That's when everything turns off and it's time to begin your routine. It is you, like we do it for babies. They have to have a routine. This is when they go to sleep. This is when they get up. But when we're grownups, we're like, I don't need a routine. I can stay up till one in the morning and get up at five and go to work and I'll be fine. I'll catch up on the weekend. No, you won't. <laughs> you won't. You can never get back sleep that you've missed. It's just gone. And so you can make it. You can have a diffuser and diffuse some lavender or some cedar wood or you know, one of those things to help. You can take a nice bath um, and relax. Anything like that just to get to able to say sleep is really important. Just like you on my phone, actually. I have on iPhone, there is a sleep button. And you can tell it when you want to go to sleep, how much sleep you want to get. And so 10 p.m. is my cutoff too. But at 9.30, my phone says, it's time for you to start getting ready for bedtime. <laughs> and then at 10 o'clock, it's like, okay, it's, it starts to sing the beginnings of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star <laughs> to remind me like bed. Well, <laughs> that's funny. So now we've, we've got it down to our phones or, or our babysitters, <laughs> right? Make well, that's sure you... a, right. But that's, that's another thing. Sometimes for some people, you don't want to sleep with your phone in your bedroom. If you're one of those people who are going to reach for it, leave your phone outside of your bedroom. It helps too because in the morning, it'll force you to get up if you're one of those people who doesn't like to get up. But it'll actually force you to get out of bed instead of snoozing 
because the alarm is going to bother you. But best practice really is to just go to sleep and let your body wake you up naturally. Right. And it's it might be easier to do with work pe- them where people still working from home that you can actually just, can you tune into when you're tired and go to bed? And yes. then when you wake up now, I wake up all night long. So sometimes I have to check with myself and say, am I actually awake <laughs> or did I just wake up? If that makes sense. <laughs> yes. No, it does. I, I get it. it. And it's different. Like some people have insomnia, right? Some people, their circadian rhythm is completely off because they could be working shifts like nurses. I, oh, I yeah. understand because I use night shifts. And so all that throws your circadian rhythm off. And so then what do people do? Then they want Benadryl or they want melatonin. Or a brownie. Which is a hormone. (laughs) Or or a brownie. They want to wake up and go have a brownie and then go back to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Just, you know, it's like if you're working shift work, I need to stay awake. So I'm going to take these things. I need to sleep. So I'm going to take these things. And I guess they just completely mess with you. So when you so when you balanced out your gut, what effects did you have that you didn't because we at the beginning you said something about, you know, all of the systems are tied to gut health. Did you have things happen that you didn't realize were tied to your gut health? Yes, so my doctor for years had wanted to put me on an antidepressant and I refused. Um just because I feel like I knew that I was sad and probably if I would have taken a PHQ-9 test, it would have showed probably moderate depression. Um, But I always just felt like I can just kind of get through it. And one of the ways that I did that was through counseling, right? So never underestimate the power of counseling. It does work for people. Um, But also with my Crohn's disease, I had had some skin issues, um, that would appear. And actually that's a known thing with Crohn's disease. You get skin manifestations. So it's no wonder and joint problems. So it's no wonder all of those things can, can be tied together. And so all of that cleared up. But I also think too, that I started getting my energy back. So I, I wasn't just willing to lie down as much. I was like, no, let's go and let's do some fun things. And stuff that I hadn't been able to do before. Which I think is a big deal for a lot of people. I mean, um, you like fatigue. I feel like fatigue creeps up on you. And then one day you look back and you think, how did I become this person who just wants to nap all the time? And what happened to my energy? And if you ask your doctor, they might test, they might test your thyroid. They might not, but I don't think it would occur to them that to tell you to clean up your diet. No, most people, yeah, they check your thyroid partially (laughs) because majority of the time they're not getting the thyroid panel that you need to be able to identify um, everything else. But yeah, nobody was like, the reason you're tired is because you're eating crackers and rice and all of the things. And you know, that's another thing. So now, like, remember I told you post-nasal drip, headache, any sign that I have or you have that you get, whatever that symptom is, sign or symptom, chances are it's originating in your gut. So that headache that all of a sudden you just got, yeah, it could be because you have been staring at the computer screen for too long, but chances are underlying that this isn't the first time it's related to your gut. Right. And, and being able to, to be aware, to detect when that's happening and notice the correlation of events. And sometimes what if I think something's related to something, I'll do an experiment uh, where I'll say, well, I, do, I won't have that for a while. And then I'll, I'll try again and see what happens and I'll suffer through what happens <laughs> because it is a suffering, but then I've got proof, but then I have proof. Oh yeah, it was that. Okay. So check, don't do that again or choose when I do it. Choose when I yes. do it. 
Choices are very important because every single day we all make choices. We choose what we're putting, what we're eating. We choose what we slather on our skin, which is usually filled with a lot of toxic chemicals. Um, we get to make a choice every single day. And that is the beauty of this whole thing is that just because you've been living a certain way, you always have the power to make a different choice or, and you know, you can always to, get help. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be overwhelming because I think, I think about when I first started taking care of my weight way back in my twenties, it was overwhelming because no one had taught me about food really. Like I didn't know about nutrition. I didn't know what was portion sizes. I didn't know all those things and it felt impossible. So it's like one, remember I bring a friend. I, uh, I did a podcast episode on being a badass. Always bring a friend when you're going to be a badass. Um, bring a friend, but also like be okay that it's a, it's a process to educate yourself and to learn, right? You don't, you Absolutely. can't know it all at the beginning, which is a good thing because it's, I find it int interesting to learn things along the way. And when you learn something new, you get to say, hey, guess what, everybody? I learned something new. <laughs> well, it's And then you can growth. implement it. Yeah, growth is, is why we're all here. We're, we're not meant to not learn anything new. We're meant to have experiences. You experience them and you take the lesson from it and move on. You know, right. what do they, people say it all the time. What if you do the same thing over and over and over again, it's insanity, right? That's why you always choose the path. Right. And what is this? What's in the, it does the, so I haven't checked out your free gut health guide yet. Is that give people kind of some realistic or not realistic, some, you know, ideas of how to start approaching feeling better? Yeah, so, well, the gut guys uh a list and i have like all the symptoms i mean all the systems i like give you systems some things that you probably wouldn't think are tied to your gut um but i actually just published and i probably need to give you that link on my website which is this whole thing you know five things that you should that you're probably doing that you shouldn't be doing to help with your gut and that's all these things that i talked about today um, just in written format. Oh, exciting. And because some people like it written down. Yes. I yeah, like free guides. I love free guides. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you were going, so what I'm just thinking like some, a final, like if you were going to say to someone, one thing, a final word of wisdom to just help people maybe if they haven't started yet or if they have started and they're struggling, anything, a final word of wisdom to help people. It only takes one step. You only have to make one decision at one time. And this might be a little long, but other people will tell you maybe you can't do it. But if you believe inside of you that you need a change, only need to do one thing. You don't have to do all of the things I mentioned today. Pick one. You pick the one thing that you think is realistic and fits in with your lifestyle and you do it and you write it down and you celebrate that win. And then once you're doing it consistently, then maybe you can add it something. Else. Totally true. Yes. Because, well, one thing at a time. And I like the celebrate part. That's awesome. Yeah. So you got to celebrate. If we don't celebrate, it's, it's the same thing. I tell people that you need to have vitamin J. That's what I was, I learned that in school, vitamin J, which is joy, right? You need joy in your life. And it doesn't matter if other people are going to judge you. Sometimes I stand here and my nieces think I'm a horrible dancer, but it doesn't matter. I will turn off the music and I will dance. Nobody watching you if people are because I'm comfortable enough with me and it makes me happy. So do right? it makes you happy. Very true. Wise words. And if you are happy, I mean, I think it both, goes both ways. If your gut's happy, you'll be happy. If you're happy, your yeah. gut will be happier, right? 
Yep. Thank you so happy much. Gut, happy life. Happy gut, happy life, my friends. And if you aren't feeling like your guts are great, well, go check out, at least check out Kara's gut download. The information to find Kara is in the show notes. I can never remember whether they're above or below. I think it depends on where you're watching or listening, but definitely check those out and let us know how you're doing. Let us and send questions. And if you have questions, um, you know, we're always here for you, my friends. Um, take care of yourselves. Maybe get some sleep. <laughs> have an amazing week, my Definitely. friends. Thanks, Kara. <laughs> take Bye. care. Bye. Hi, my friend. Thanks so much for listening to this entire podcast. If you found it useful and you're like me and you like, like helping others, please feel free to share this. Just give it a like give it a comment. If you found something useful in it, there's a chance that someone else will find something useful as well. Also, if you have any questions at all, I can absolutely help and I would love to help. You can email me at heather at prosperityflowcoaching.com. If you want more of this awesome content, you can follow me on Instagram, Heather Stewart Coaching. You can follow me on Facebook, Prosperity Flow Coaching. And I have a personal request. I want to help as many people as I can with these podcasts. And if you could give me a review, hopefully a good one, <laughs> if you could share, if you could send this out into the world, I would truly appreciate it. I hope you have an amazing day. And I hope that you find your way to wellness by getting back to me. Take care, my friend. <laughs>